Good morning. All right, so um, this is my second talk for uh, this conference. And um, well, today I'll be talking about uh, natural disaster prediction techniques. So I would like to share my experience uh, uh, in terms of forecasting natural disaster with everyone today. Uh, but first of all, uh, we heard about the clammy plates and what Ben has talked about this morning, about how something far away beyond our solar system can affect something inside our solar system. The, the solution is in the boundary condition because uh, every system have a boundary, like the helisphere and other things. Same thing for these planet plates. Uh, you see that there's a boundary condition like that, resulting in a circular shape. But if there's a change in boundary condition, oops, okay, you start to see that something even right around the corner, further away, and actually seeds some lines that extend toward the inner part. And we can see such evidence pretty clear uh, in the cosmic ray. Uh, if someone have read some articles about how uh, cosmic ray has season, or even uh, like planetoids, like all those stuff, that actually when Earth is aligned with some certain constellation, there's more, you know, falling stars and, you know, comets and other things coming in. So those are seeding points, or actually setting the external boundary condition that actually creating some thing that draws into the solar system. And that's uh, in terms of my understanding. So I just want to answer the question of how some external thing can influence something internal. It's not through gravity, for sure. Okay, we go to the main uh, topic here. All right. So when we talk about prediction, what does it mean? Just like everything uh, in this world, everybody in this room come here. We actually have to know where we come, where we go, right? We travel from, let's say from me, start uh, travel from Virginia to Pittsburgh. I have to be able to predict how long it takes for me to drive from my hometown to destination point. In order to do that, it actually requires a lot of knowledge about the car, about the road, about the weather conditions, you know, accident along the way, in order to make the accurate predictions. So predictions is actually the most important part in science because it tests your ability to understand how things really work. And if any science, uh, scientific theory that people can come up and could not predict anything, what it does it really mean it doesn't mean, it means that that theory or that person who come up with that theory doesn't know anything about that subject. <laughs> it's simple as that, okay? So in, 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 in science, especially in engineering, we build stuff. We build stuff according to what we visualize and it come out to be what we plan to be. That means we actually know how it works. <laughs> so prediction, is the most important part in science. And um, I like this to be a concept where, you know, an important part of scientific uh, communities today because we actually lack a lot of prediction, especially about solar activities, earthquakes, tropical storm formation, all types of natural disaster because, um, as seen in the news, they said, or many scientists said, that this thing is unpredictable. So you know what it means. 
So are they the expert? Okay, now, how to be an expert? <laughs> so we have to understand how all this stuff works, how everything interacts with everything, how everything are connected with everything, not the other way around. If someone say, if earthquake is a random coincidence, it doesn't connect with anything, it just suddenly arises from itself with no reason, it's just kind of random statistic, you know what it means, okay? It doesn't matter who that person have a degree in, it no matters that person is working in some well-known institution, it doesn't matter at all. You can be a teacher, you can be a nurse, you can be a housewife, and you can predict this stuff. If you know where to look for clues and understand the right correlations. Okay, what I try to uh, uh, give a lecture today is about that. And to do that, we actually have to see the real thing. You just have to use our own perceptions. What we can see, hear, touch, smell, taste, and feel. And of course, understand those correlations. And the main techniques we use, of course, we need to uh, understand the law of nature, the law of dependent origination. That means we observe some certain place, something occur, and then the other thing occur. Something falls, and then the other thing falls. Something sustain, the other thing sustain. And that's all you need. It has nothing to do with some certain man-made law of physics to explain what is real or what is not real, because it is what it is. So in this case, um, but in order to do that, we need to understand a lot of characteristics of that material or what we uh, try to observe. And that relies on past experience, you know, or, or people's experience that is different. Um, I would like to uh, give you some example of how we do this. And of course, everyone can do it. I give you, maybe people have seen this, but if I show you this, and can you tell me what it is? It's, you know it's yellow, right? And of course, if you want to play around this or want to know what it does, we need to know more about it. So we have to feel it, right? So now we know it's flexible. So of course, it's rubber, right? What's rubber do is when it falls down to the ground, it's going to bounce. Now you can predict things, right? This is how you do predictions. <laughs> and of course, it's gonna do it like that. And how many times you need to do this to know you, your knowledge is true? A few times, right? If it happened exactly what you expect, you know it's true. That's how you do prediction. You don't actually have to do this thousand times. Okay, so now, Next. Okay, we, I know that this is the law of gravity, right? We know the law of gravity. So if it falls down, it's gonna bounce. And that's all it is. Is that all science that is? Is that all? No. We need to seek for new things, right? We need to discover new things. But how are you actually gonna discover new things? We have to, um, explore new properties of this material, but how do you do that? You know that if this property looks like this is flexible, what, what if it flip? It's doing it the opposite, like this. It become more stiff, right? And of course, what happened if it's stiff and you drop it to the ground? It bounced? Or it doesn't bounce, right? You don't bounce as much, right? Okay. We see it if you drop it like this, not much, right? 
So it depends, it's a conditional thing. So now you can predict things. What if the condition changed? Let's say you drop it from higher, what's gonna happen? A little more, okay. You have to test our uh, predictions, right? And of course, that's how we learn new things. So we have to test the prediction. <laughs> so how many times do I need to do this in order for you to know what is actually happening? Maybe, okay, one time? And one more time, okay. Probably a fluke, right? Two times, is that enough? Two times is enough, okay. Same thing for all those earthquake predictions, natural disaster, all types. If you can do it one, two, three times, then you're done. If you want to do more, it's up to you. You learn new things all the time. And that's how you know for sure that you know the subject you're studying. You don't need to go all the way back hundred years, thousands of years, and keep repeating everything all the way, just like someone tried to claim that if something's true, you have to go through all those thousands of years of data to prove that everything is real. Okay, so now go back to uh, the topic a little bit. So yesterday, we t I talked about the, the resonance system and how the Earth interacts with the environment as well as the sun. And now I show you uh, the, real, the real device um, that I put in my presentation here. So this is two balls here made of aluminum. And of course inside it's like, you know, just a ball you can buy from a dollar store and things like that. And of course there's a transmitter. I, I hope everyone see this. And of course I tune it to some certain frequency so the generators supply to a transformer on the bottom on the bo on the bottom plates go up to the capacitor okay and then of course power transmit to the other side now the way we can understand how solar activity works is that this thing can be modulated from environment for example i put my hand See the LED lights? The condition of the power transfer change. Same thing for this side. Independent of these things, you can do the same thing, okay? So we have uh, multiple ways that you can modulate the energy at their destination. So the LED represents uh, the potential, right? If the LED is bright, it means you have high, like high, high potential, so you have got more power coming in. The LED is dampening. One is that this thing is detuned, so it detuned from the resonance, so there's less, uh, the maximum power transfer condition wasn't supply, apply anymore. The second is there's a leakage, so the power actually leaks from the sphere to my hand. So this is like a dampening uh, factor, okay? So same thing for natural disaster and earthquake and everything. So it requires initial conditions. It requires uh, understanding of environments surrounding that area, surrounding where the earthquake is gonna be occur or where the storm is gonna be occur. Of course, it's required on, it relies on the source or the main drive which is the sun. So when we understand all these factors and we combine all of them together, we can do a reliable prediction and forecast. So let's first start with the sun. Okay. Now the roles of surrounding plasma in modeling solar activities. The way to do this, uh, it has to be through experiment. The experiment I'm gonna show you here is called the fuser, where we generate a plasma sphere. 
Okay, so in this case, we have a vacuum tube and we pump the air out. So here is a, it's like a cage, like a, a round ball here and apply with high voltage, about nine kilovolts, AC, but you can do DC as well. And of course this glass is below silicate glass. So let's observe what happened when the conditions of the surrounding change, how does it affect what's inside this chamber. So in this chamber, you see here, uh, we have one electrode go to the center, the others go to the plate. Now we just create a plasma ball. You start to see there's some kind of filaments coming out, flickering. You see the filaments that are actually changing all the time. And these filaments here actually interact with, in the, with the environment surrounding the sphere. It doesn't come from the sphere inside by itself. And this is when you have high vacuum, so it's pump out all the gas. So it's a uh, low pressure environment. Now let's wait until, let's say there's some kind of leakage coming into the uh, vacuum tube. Now you start to see. Now that when the air start leaking in, you get more plasma coming in, you see more activities in the sphere. Yeah, there's some leak. Let's say there's a vacuum tube has some kind of a leak, right? Then you can see that uh, the activity change depending on the environment. The activity doesn't change from the inside. Wow. Okay. Well, it does, but just like us, we have activities. You know, we interact with the environments all the time. The environment change, we interact differently. It's the same way the suns work. So those filaments, you have plumes, you have, uh, of course, like that. Same thing happened with this experiment. So let's talk about when for observation for high plasma density. So you see that there's more filaments. This looks like high solar activity period. Of course, there's more electrical discharge around the surface. Strong magnetic activities, I'm talking about filaments type magnetic. And of course, uh, the mainstream science call this solar maximum. Of course, when you have more activities, you got more electrical discharge, so you got higher X-ray emission. Of course, it's called higher number of sunspots. Of course, uh, on the other hand, you have a low plasma density, so it become more uniform it's similar to the way we call this solar minimum. So less filaments-like structure, but they still can be filaments, but it's just not as bright and not uh, high intense. It's weak. That's, I'm talking about the filaments type, not the magnetic polar field. So this is a different one. Of course, if it's weak, in that case, it's strong electric. What I mean by electrics is um, you have higher potential, higher stress environment than when the, you have too much plasma going around because plasma itself, it seems like when you have filaments, you have more power dissipation in that filaments. So it's more stress actually when there's solar minimum. And of course, there's lower X-ray emission, all those photo flares. So you have different types of characteristic be in two different uh, uh, weather condition. Of course, low number of sunspots. Now, look at the outer edge of the system here. You start to see something glow here. And I, I, I don't know what's gonna be real, but it looks like a pillow pause as well. So you have something glow at the center. There's always gonna be something glowing on the boundaries. And of course, uh, Rob Jerkins has mentioned about how the sun is actually a focus of cosmic electrical discharge, just like what, we ha well, what he has visualized. 
Now, let's do a summary here. So when uh, the plasma concentration is high at the sun environment, it actually means uh, this high concentration of plasma in both two because it's a one system. They are connected. So what happened here is that the CME is more visible. All the solar wind fluctuation is higher visible because the plasma environment is more energetic. It's easy to observe CMEs and all X-ray flares, of course, increased number of sunspots. On the other side, on Earth, what's going to happen when you have high energetic energy or particles? Uh, what happened, what I observe is you have increasing moisture content and increased chance of tropical storm formation and of course lower electrical stress in dielectric because it's all dissipation is in the atmosphere. So what happened, you have lower stress in the dielectric, so there's less earthquake. So if you have, uh, if you heard the news about the CMEs hitting the Earth, Earth-directed CMEs, and you observe earthquakes activities, they'll be suppressed during those times. But on the other hand, you see a lot of activities in the atmosphere instead. So, now we just go to resonant here. So on the other hand, when the plasma uh, density around the sun is weak, same thing for the Earth, because it's a one connected system. So you have a uniform glow, less visible CMEs, all those eruptions are hard to observe. There's less X-ray flares, and decreasing number of sunspots. Uh, on the other hand, if you observe the Earth, what's gonna happen is you have decreased moisture content. This is when sunspot is declining. So you see the weather has become more clear uh, you can observe this yourself. Of course, if the, there are less moisture contents, there will be decreasing chance of tropical storm formation, except there's some kind of fluctuations, some kind of a short-term events. And of course, when you have less moisture in the air, uh, dielectric become more stressful, the ground become more stressful, so higher chance of earthquake. So this is why there's some people in the uh, scientific community have observed that large earthquakes typically occur when there's no sunspot. Okay, but if you have to understand um, the condition of the, the plasma environment surrounding the Earth, we actually can predict um, a lot of ty different types of natural disaster. Now on the other hand, if you have coral mass ejection, which is more like particle types that shoot from the sun, of course, depending on the direction. This is something uh, we have been studying a lot. Um, if it's earth directed, so you have a big cloud from that sphere going to the other sphere. What's gonna happen is it causes more electrical discharge. You see a lot of, you can have impacts on power grids and all kinds of things. Increasing plasma density, of course, we see brighter auroras. Uh, this is, uh, what we know, and of course, more strong formations. What about non-directed CMEs? When they say it's mist, it doesn't hit Earth. It's just like the way I have moved my hand. So let's say I have some kind of figuring here. So first, there's a solar eruptions. See the light flickering is uh, right away. So within about 24 hours, something's happened right here. And then you have another secondary wave passing through. Depending on how, how fast it moves, you can have figuring on this side. So this is figuring as well, even though it's missed. Or you can have direct hit. So you have different, uh, different types of effects. So it's really... Uh, we should be really careful about how we predict something because sometimes you might heard the news that 
there's a large CMEs and then it missed the earth, so you don't need to worry about it. It's just like this. When the condition flips, it doesn't necessarily mean you don't need to worry about it. <laughs> it's something else happening that the per that person not aware of it. <laughs> That's what it means. <laughs> now, um, this is what I repeated uh, in the last uh, presentation that in the atmosphere you have plates, you have both electric field and magnetic fields. And the magnetic field is 90 degrees or perpendicular to electric field. But once there are certain modulations occur on, those, on these layers, um, you start to see charge separation actually on the plate below and the plate above. And of course, you start to see kind of vertex type. That's, this is one of the reasons why, you know, all those stuff that is formed or some events formed look like a dot. Like the earthquake, it's like a dot. It does not go along the lines. It's just a dot with the epicenter because it's a dot electrical discharge. Or like a storm, or even when the, the new Iceland form, it's like a dot, uh, like the one I show yesterday. Now let's go to uh, earthquake predictions. And it could be volcanic eruptions, but I did not observe enough to make conclusion about volcanic eruption, but they tends to be anti-correlated. So when there's a large volcanic eruptions, the typically the earthquake strengths become less intense. So the stress release mechanism become volcanic eruption instead of earthquakes. So, so the way to predict thing is really flexible and then highly dynamic. So let's talk about the long-term earthquake predictions. If we look at the statistic of earthquakes with magnitude greater than eight, you see that it happened about once a year. Uh, in, this, in this table here, um, let's say start from 2004, 2015. And this line here represents um, just the occurrence of earthquake. This happened about once a year, except that when there's a time in the solar minimum, extreme minimum or close to the minimum, you have more frequent earthquake than other times. And of course, during solar maximum, around 2012, when you have a lot of events, you see a little bit more earthquakes. So the earthquakes work as a threshold, not as um, kind of a linear type. And this is the, uh, the plot of sunspot number, uh, the top charts here, going to the minimum and then go to this current cycle, which is solar cycle 24. The bottom here is a statistic of the, earth, the frequency of earthquake with magnitude greater than seven, okay? It's very hard to see correlations, but if you put the threshold in there, you start to see that, um, you can see high earthquakes become more frequent when sunspot reach minimum. Okay, this is a, if you want to forecast a uh, large earthquake correctly, you know, you have to understand the statistic, uh, you know, the, the past history. What about the short terms? If you want to do forecast daily, so we also need to look at the peak, the local peak of this sunspot, which is just a representation of the plasma density in the surrounding environment. So in case of the Penny Power earthquake, uh, sorry, actually uh, happened on April, not March. And um, it's on March 25th. Sorry, April 25th. Um, the, the sunspot reached its highest point around April 20 to 23rd. So this is 10 weeks uh, local maximum. So this is a time that we should observe what's gonna be happening with Earth. And of course, during that time, there's gonna be a fluctuation of weather. Uh, you can see if people live in the equator, you see that the, the weather changed quite rapidly. It's extremely hot during that time uh, before the earthquakes. 
during the epicenter, there's a strong wind um, in Nepal. So it just, all of a sudden, there's so much winds going on, and then earthquakes occur. And if you look at the sun, you see a strong coronal mass ejection uh, around April 20th, 21st, and also as well as on the 23rd, we have uh, flares. And of course, there's a low level of geomagnetic storm. And of course, the planets align. So we have a lot of factors that coming in into play around those times, so you know when to watch for, these, for such events. So it's not really difficult to do a, a forecast or prediction if we understand where to look. Next is a timeline of the earthquakes in Nepal. Start, started with um, the coronal mass ejection uh, happened on the 21st, sorry, sorry, April 21st. So during the time when there's a solar eruptions on the 21st, you start to see something happen on Earth around the same time. And that served as a, a precursor. So during that time, you see a uh, foreshock of magnitude of 5.1 uh, occur during those times with this peak of sunspot. And of course, there's another big uh, coronal mass ejection. It's like a big burst, but it's missed the Earth. But if we look at the, the model of semantic experiment, you see that the ripple occur at the center go radially outward toward every direction. So it was going to have some impact. So it's very important to look for this clue and do not ignore this type of events. When some news say, okay, there's a big blast and it's going to miss the earth, it's nothing is going to happen. It's not like that in reality. Uh, now, so during that time, the corona hole, which just happened to align with the Earth during the same time, which is predicted on the 25th, and that's when the large earthquake occurred on Nepal. And it follows with the aftershock. Of course, you see two of these corona holes just line up the same way. And of course, uh, three days afterwards from the main, uh, main events at the sun, and the three day is pretty much the same uh, day that uh, the plasma wind takes to travel from the sun to the earth. Next, uh, we talk about the uh, Japan earthquake that happened on March 11, 2011. Uh, this is an extreme case for solar maximum but we're looking for something that break the records over a short period of time, like in, in a period of two weeks. In this case, um, you can see that the, the sun is really not much activities, uh, weak sunspot. And then all of a sudden, it just rise up by a factor of two in pretty much in less than two weeks. Something is gonna happen to the Earth during that time. So, of course, it's happened with a warning on March 8th. So in those time, we will observe a uh, big coronal mass ejection occur, again, non-Earth directed, so nothing to worry about or not. <laughs> so, at the same time, we see March, uh, during that time, corona holes uh, line up around the time when the earthquakes occur on March 11. So this is March 10. And of course, Earth's away give a warning. And that warning occur during a time when there's low activity, around 24 hours. So we have the, uh, the foreshock in Japan. I think it's about magnitude of 7.2. So that's give the first warning. And then you can count the days, two or three days afterward, to see the next one which is the main one. But this is talk, I'm talking about the, the extreme case uh, that we can observe uh, 
to this day is probably magnitude of seven or eight of uh, what about if it happened on the maximum it's probably going to be the same for the minimum so the first uh, we talk about uh, the Japan earthquakes with magnitude of 9.1 happened about three days after the peak in sunspot. Now during the decline, it's worked the same way. So if you want to track what would be the next time you should observe space weather or some natural disaster, um, it's necessary to look for the peak. In this case, the second peak is the minimum right here. It's happened on the 20th uh, of March 2011. So it's three week extreme low number of sunspots following the Japan earthquakes. Uh, of course, hot weather and light cloud concentration uh, occur 24 hours before earthquake. Of course, another thing is the backside CME. This is a big uh, CME, but actually go to the back on the backside, so it missed the earth as well. Uh, but it generates the M-class flares on March 23rd. And of course, the geomagnetic storm is not very strong. Uh, this is a corner hole, it's the same way, it's aligned uh, with the Earth on March 20. Um, but let's talk about the next case. This is a uh, so minimum uh, case study during the time uh, for Sumatra earthquake in 2004 in December. What you see here is that uh, before that case happened, you see uh, the peak in sunspots, and then it has a long continuous decline, start from October, late October, and continue the decline until some certain, pe certain period here. You see that piece here where it start to converge up? That is when we need to observe uh, the condition more carefully. So in this time, um, you also have a big uh, CMEs um, that happened on the 23rd, which is marked as the beginning of the, the observation. In this case, you can look at the sunspot minimum because sometimes it's really difficult to see CMEs during solar minimum but we can use a uh, corner hole to observe these events because the corner hole tends to line up during that time as well. And the same thing, uh, similar to Nepal earthquake, we have planets aligned again between Earth, Mercury, and Mars. Same things for the Nepal earthquakes. And of course, there's a precursor that occur uh, on the 23rd, give the first warning and then the main shock, about two and a half days afterward. So it's a very consistent uh, pattern that you can track. If it's happened one time, it's a coincidence, right? Two times, probably, maybe not. Three times, of course not. So the same thing happened. So let's go back to early 2007. So during that time, you see the peak, the first peak happened. Um, of sunspot, and it follows three days afterward with the magnitude of 8.2 earthquake. After that, the sunspot continue about 68-day declines. Uh, one thing I want to mention before uh, when we observe this is that for large earthquake, it has to have some long duration of separation between the, the next one. This one is too close but it does have something as well, but less magnitudes uh, between uh, uh, February 12 to February 17. This is another second type of observation, but it's not gonna be as big as that one because it's too close. And then if it's continued to decline, now the, this is 68 days decline. Now you see it start converging up and you start to see activities. This is minimum converging back up. 
and of course it reached about two weeks high. That's when you start to observe again. This is the next one that is going to happen. And you can see this um, at the same time with corner holes. You can see that the corner holes line up on January 13, which is the same day as the earthquake of magnitude 8.2. These corner holes line up on March 30, which is on this day. So it's about three days from the main earthquake. So you can use corner holes as a, a, a reference, but you have to put some kind of variations around that about three days to, uh, to put a good forecast or prediction. Now, next one, the Chilean earthquakes. Now it's more than coincident, right? <laughs> three, four times about the same patterns. Uh, the Chilean earthquakes happened on September 16, 2015. Um, in this case, I published uh, this connection of patterns online um, in the journal uh, New Concept in Global Tectonic, the same one that Ben did publish the paper. And you can see that um, a continuous decline lasting 116 days. Um, it starts to converge around this point. The way to look for convergence is we have to look for a record breaking sunspot minimum. But this doesn't, ha doesn't apply when, it, when it's reached extreme minimum because it's, way, it's reaching minimum all the time. So you have to use other techniques. But this is uh, the techniques has been quite reliable. Um, you look for some long period record breaking uh, minimum sunspots and then you look for a record breaking for high. The first peak when it converged, you start to see earthquakes happen. And this time we see this precursor as well occur around this time frame. I think it's in uh, Nicaragua or something, I don't remember. And then you have the main earthquakes in Chile about two, three days afterward. So this pattern has been repeated many times. Okay, big CMEs that actually occur uh, three days before Burma's earthquake. And when we utilize this, for me, this is a plasma model that they've um, been using uh, to model of charged particles. But I've talked about longitude wave propagations and I believe there's a additional mode that uh, doing something like this in the same line as the main uh, plasma wind or interplanetary, whatever, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> so, uh, so in this time frame, you see that it missed the Earth for sure, yeah. And at the same time, you have sector boundary crossing uh, between Earth and uh, the solar wind uh, speed here. You can see the solar wind increase on March 23rd. Okay, as well as you have uh, M-class flares around that time. As well as magnetic fluctuations uh, detected at ACE satellite. And for Burma earthquakes, sorry, I have to go back to Burma earthquakes again. There's a far shock in Burma. Uh, around the time when you, when you have uh, CMEs, these are, these are CME events. And you see that the earth shakes almost instantaneous when you have a big events at the sun. And then you have a main events afterward, about three days later. So that's why I developed the longitude um, model and use semantic experiment to explain what I have discovered in terms of earthquake. So this is not in the textbook and um, it's based on the real observation. <coughs> and if you track uh, some moderate earthquakes, you see the same patterns repeating all over again. So this is the first uh, Nepal earthquake happened about three days after uh, the peak in sunspot. And then following, you have the minimum, 
you got the earthquakes again. And then maximum, you got another earthquake again. And then another minimum, you have another 7.5 magnitude earthquakes. So is it predictable? <laughs> so, uh, but it's not, that's not all. Um, the patterns does repeat uh, for a certain period of time and then some time it just disappear. And we will talk a little more about it uh, in, in the next few slides here. Um, another case here for geomagnetic storm. Uh, this year again, uh, for there's a big uh, solar activities occur on between April 13 to 15. See these large filaments going outside uh, to the eastern side, and the CMEs occur, and you see there's a hollow CME. And of course, if you count three days afterward, um, so this is a prediction. Um, there's some, there are many predictions that actually seems like it missed the Earth. <coughs> but you see geomantic storm anyway, as well as the earthquakes that occur. Um, this occur on the April 17. So this is one of the prediction. Um, that goes this side. Um, and of course, you also see like hit and miss definition, like no CMEs but auras anyway. This type of things can be explained using um, the model I propose. So this is additional to what we know. So next is a storm formation. So Earthquakes is something happened below the ground. Now we have to observe something above the ground, which also interact with each other. But it's mostly anti-correlated from what I observed. So for storm formation, in the case of Hurricane Sandy, um, we look for charged particles because the, the air needs to be ionized. So it relies on X-ray solar flares. Now we go into the solar maximum, like when there's high intense uh, plasma. Period. So in this case, we have um, the big solar flares occur with X class um, on October 23rd. And of course, you got multiple CMEs, and you can forecast its arrival time around the Earth. So it arrived here. The first CMEs arrive on the October 23rd. That's when you start to see the formation of storm. And next CMEs uh, arrive on 24th when you start to see the intensification of the storm. And of course, the storm reached some certain maximum and it dies down when it reached the shore or some certain condition change. And the next one occur on October 29. So it seems to gain strength again a little bit. So this is uh, a pattern. Another one is a, a super typhoon Haiyan that happened in November 2013. It happened during a time when you have the most intense uh, solar flares in the year, in 2013. Uh, the first uh, CME was observed on November 2nd. It's arrived at Earth on November 4th. That's when you start to see the formation of storm. And of course, um, followed by X-ray, X3 class. So that's when you see that the plasma become energetic around uh, the atmosphere. And it follows by another hollow CMEs, which is Earth-directed CMEs. Arrive on November 5 to 6, you see the, the storm become more intense during those time. And it dies down after some certain period on November 10. On November 7, there's another CMEs supposed to arrive at Earth um, on November 9, but you see that the storm, this storm dies down. However, the new storm form, storm O03A form in the Indian Ocean instead. So one storm docked and one storm form. So it either is de intensify one storm and intensify the other storm. Now, uh, the, um, the third case study for 
the hurricane, uh, the storm. This time is Hurricane Jacqueline, which happened this year in September 2015. On September 23rd this year, you see uh, the first CME. Um, of course, if you calculate the times arrive, even though it's not hitting the Earth, it's going to arrive on the 27th around the orbital plane of, 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 the, of the Earth. So you start to see uh, the storm start to form. And then the X-ray flares occur, uh, M7, which is pretty intense as well. So it, the air become more energized, but until there are second CMEs that actually occur, so the big impulse occur, um, arrived on October 1st, the storm gained strength again. And then it go into a steady state of wind speed until the next one, um, whoops, the next one arrived on October 3rd to October 4th. You start to see it gain strength again, but it drops in speed. But at the same time, the new storm formed on October 4th, a uh, storm called o Oho. So you have a continuous uh, events happening in synchronicity and connected to each other. So of course, this the forecast become more complicated in in certain time when you have uh, a lot of things happen in in a continuous chain. But when the storm, but everything calms down, and all of a sudden occur, that's easier to predict. Next one. Now, the last but not least, I'd like to talk about the long-term conditioning of climates. As we know that um, uh, how charged particles actually affects uh, the rain or moisture contents, we can look into uh, the Am Amazon forest, which is on the southern hemisphere, and it's, uh, it's placed near the equator where we have a high, highest electric field. And as, at the same time, you have um, South Atlantic anomalies where the land Van Allen radiation belt is the closest to, to the surface. So at that place, you have the highest concentration of fresh water. So um, this is how um, Space weather actually modulates the climates uh, on Earth. And if you observe a little closely in the Amazon area, there's no earthquake because there's so much fresh water, there's so much charge uh, transfer, so there's no stress building up in the ground. So, and I think the ancient people knows about this as well. Uh, that's why they built some pyramids and things like that. It's actually a place where I believe there are energy exchange, so the ground over there is, is more stable than other places. As well as um, the, all the high-rise that human built uh, in modern day's world, um, that actually affects the climate as well. Uh, what I observe is that the, the storm is hard, highly uh, likely to, to form around the, the, the highly dense populated area full of towers with lightning rods and things like that. But it's likely to form where it's some, somewhere that's more remote. So now we combine all the prediction together. So in, in terms of the prediction techniques I use, uh, I, I based on the sunspots. So let's see, this is a sunspot um, plot uh, from July to September. This is before the Chilean earthquake in September 16. So you see that it's actually go up and down, up and down. So we need to mark this spot and actually look at whether this is breaking the record or not. This is one thing I do. So then after that, we know this is a place to look for things that have more significant events going to occur. 
And of course, what you found is this. So earthquake happened um, around the time frame where this transition of sunspot where it break the records. And of course, there's some place that doesn't have earthquakes. If you look here uh, around July 30, August 17 to 20, and so forth like that. So how do we know during that time there's no earthquake or there's going to be earthquake? You look for the storm formations. If there's, there's a lot of storm in, in that generates around the earth, there's high moisture content, in those times, the earthquakes is high, unlikely to occur. This uh, exam, uh, what about before earthquakes? For example, here in September 5th, 2015, uh, we have a lot of storm uh, form around the earth and actually exists about one, two, three, four, five. And then all of a sudden, everything disappear. That's when you look for earthquakes, large earthquakes. So on the September 13, you see that all the storm dissipated. That paved the really good condition to create some uh, or stress buildup. So we know what kind of forecast we can do and how we can, uh, we can say, okay, what type is gonna be underground activities or is gonna be atmospheric activities? So I think this is conclude my talk. For conclusions, uh, I propose uh, a techniques based on space weather conditions. And the predictions relies on understanding of wave propagation, plasma in space or in the atmosphere, as well as electrical resonance circuits. And the prediction is based on the trend of sunspot number, corona holes and CMEs, as well as planetary alignment and of course, we want to emphasize that uh, the surrounding plasma plays an important role in the prediction. And of course, uh, we talk about earthquakes uh, and tropical storm in this case study. And for volcanic eruption is, is kind of anti-correlated with earthquakes in general. I mean, and when we mean anti-correlated means if there's a large volcanic eruption occur during that time, the it's hardly unlikely we can see earthquake like magnitude of eight. Earthquake can occur before volcanic eruptions, but if there's a vo large volcanic eruption occur, stress already released, somehow the earthquake doesn't seems to, you know, materialize. So um, this concludes my talk, and thank you everyone for listening.